This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that leaks the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, powering solutions that proactively protect over 2 billion employees and consumers worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. Traditional espionage and counter-espionage during the hybrid war, assessing Russian cyber attacks, Conti's fate and effects, investigating cut internet cables in France, my conversation with A.D. Brian Borndren of the FBI's Cyber Division and Deputy Assistant Attorney General Adam Hickey on reverse web shell operation and Hafnium. Our guest is Tom Kellerman of VMware to discuss the findings of their Modern Bank Heists report, And finally, the dark online world of pig butchering. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, July 22nd, 2022. The U.S. continues to look for an explanation of why Russian cyber attacks in support of its war against Ukraine, while they've certainly been conducted, have so far fallen short of the devastating potential widely expected as the special military operation began. Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber, Ann Neuberger, reviewed the bidding Wednesday at the Aspen Security Forum. Defense News quotes her as saying, With regard to the Russian use of cyber and our takeaways, there are any number of theories for what we saw and what, frankly, we didn't see. Some argue for the deterrence the U.S. has put in place, and in this she was alluding to the discussions between President Biden and Putin after the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. She says, Some argue that it was the result of the extensive cybersecurity preparations Ukraine did, supported by allies and partners, And some argue that we don't quite know. Ukraine thinks defensive preparations made a contribution to blunting Russian cyber attacks. Ilya Vityuk, head of the cybersecurity department of the Ukrainian State Security Service, pointed to the weeks of preparatory Russian cyber attacks before the actual invasion. He said, as reported by CyberScoop, for us it was like a full dress rehearsal. The Ukrainian services had an opportunity to assess the enemy's capabilities and to address their own vulnerabilities in advance of the onset of war, and he says they were able to make good use of the opportunity. Traditional espionage run by intelligence officers working under diplomatic cover has grown somewhat more difficult for Russia during the present war. The record quotes the head of Britain's MI6 as estimating that around half, roughly 400 in total, of the Russian intelligence officers operating in Europe have been expelled. Clearing compromised personnel from Ukrainian security and intelligence services is a more complex and difficult task. The Atlantic Council describes the challenges of expunging Russian sympathizers from the SBU Security Service and the Prosecutor General's Office. The heads of both agencies have been suspended, But reforming large agencies in wartime is like rebuilding a ship during a voyage. That said, Russian cyber espionage attempts continue unabated. Palo Alto Network's Unit 42 early this week outlined evidence that Russia's SVR intelligence service had been actively abusing Google Drive to distribute malware in the service of cyber espionage. TechCrunch observed that this isn't the first time the SVR has been observed making hostile use of legitimate web services. Mandiant had earlier seen the SVR using Dropbox for command and control. In the course of a discussion with advanced intelligence over the firm's study of Conti's attack against Costa Rican networks, Bleeping Computer offers a useful summary of what's happened to the gang. 
It's effectively rebranded through Dispersal. Its alumni now working for Quantum, Hive, Avos Locker, Black Cat, and Hello Kitty gangs. Security Boulevard calls these Splinter Ransomware as a Service groups. Back on April 27th, Parties Unknown severed backbone cables in three distinct locations around Paris. The actions were separated in space but closely coordinated in time. Wired reports that almost three months later, who cut the cables and why they did so remains unknown. Michel Combeau, the managing director of the French Telecoms Federation, told Wired, The people knew what they were doing. Those were what we call backbone cables that were mostly connecting network service from Paris to other locations in France in three directions. That impacted the connectivity in several parts of France. The cables were severed in ways that made them difficult to repair, but there are no obvious suspects and no obvious motive. And finally, Krebs on Security offers a depressing follow-up to warnings the FBI issued back in April about a criminal trend that's come to be known indelicately as pig butchering. It's a romance scam that lures its victims to fraudulent cryptocurrency sites and then fleeces or butchers them. Losses are said to have ranged in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Krebs on Security explains, The term pig butchering refers to a time-tested, heavily scripted, and human-intensive process of using fake profiles on dating apps and social media to lure people into investing in elaborate scams. In a more visceral sense, pig butchering means fattening up a prey before the slaughter. The scammers offer to mentor their marks in crypto speculation and in the course of that mentorship siphon off large amounts of cash. There's apparently an uglier-than-usual side to this form of organized crime, Many of the operators are people who've been trafficked and forced into the Internet scam, which seems to be mostly run from underused casinos in Cambodia. Krebs on Security notes four common elements of a pig-butchering caper. It often, but not always, begins with a dating app. According to Krebs, pig-butchering attempts are common on dating apps, but they can begin with almost any type of communication, including SMS text messages. From there, it moves to chatting over WhatsApp. There's no video used. The fraudsters always refuse to do a video call with their marks. And investment chit-chat sets the hook. The scammers say they have inside knowledge of the cryptocurrency market, and they're eager to help their new friend make money. What follows can be easily imagined. And now, a word from our sponsor, ExtraHop. With millions of dollars to earn, today's cyber attackers have grown advanced. Whether they're hiding malicious activity in encrypted channels, laying low under the guise of a trusted third party, or taking advantage of the latest CBE, they know they'll have the upper hand. In a world where attackers have the advantage, ExtraHop is on a mission to help you take it back. Learn more about how ExtraHop helps you defend your enterprise against advanced threats like supply chain compromises, ransomware, and APTs. Visit extrahop.com slash cyberwire. That's extrahop.com slash cyberwire. And we thank ExtraHop for sponsoring our show. Cloud computing and virtualization technology company VMware recently released the fifth edition of their report titled Modern Bank Heists, looking at the cybercriminal ecosystem and how defenders can best prepare for future attacks. Tom Kellerman is head of cybersecurity strategy at VMware. The genesis of this report was actually because of my work at the World Bank and the Treasury security team back in the early 2000s and the fact that we published the first ever book on the information security challenges facing the financial sector then. So it's always been my passion to understand what keeps the financial sector security leaders up at night, how are they changing their defensive strategies, and more importantly, how are the adversaries changing their modus operandi, both from a cyber attack perspective, but from an e-fraud perspective as well. 
You know, I think if you say the phrase uh, bank heist, I think a lot of us think of, you know, maybe an Ocean's Eleven kind of a scheme or, you know, an, an old Western uh, Hollywood uh, rendition of it. Um, how do we define bank heists in this modern age? Well, in this modern age, if you look at just the cyber attack itself, the bank heist has really become a hostage situation. The adversary is more likely trying to hijack the digital transformation of the financial institution and use its network, its website its mobile banking app, um, its APIs that's built out for FinTech to attack its customers. More importantly, the adversary is truly cognizant of what the crown jewels are for a financial institution. And those crown jewels are the non-public market information or the market strategies that the institution may leverage in the international markets, which is why the majority of institutions in this year's report noted that they saw evidence that the adversaries were targeting non-public market information and market strategies uh, to enable to allow for digital front running and digital insider trading. Well, let's go through some of the key findings of the report together. What are some of the things that caught your eye? Well, specifically, you know, the attack vectors uh, writ large have shifted. Um, the primary attack vector into financial institutions today is not spear phishing. I know that sounds like it's sacrilegious. Um, application attacks are the primary attack vector, uh, followed by previously deployed rats, remote access trojans that exist within the environment because of Linux-based uh, ransomware and rats writ large. The majority of institutions suffered from one over two uh, ransomware attacks and the majority paid ransom. But what was most interesting to me from an attack perspective was that 94% of them suffered attacks against APIs they built out for fintech. And those APIs were used to hijack the environment itself. How are the financial institutions doing in, in this kind of cat and mouse game here? I mean, is there is there a sense that they're ahead of the bad guys? Are they gaining ground? Where do we stand? I mean, they've definitely decreased well time and time to resolution. But that being said, the adversary still exists within the environment for days. Um, you have to accept that based on their revenues and based on what they spend on technology and cybersecurity, they're still spending less than 12% of their IT budgets on cybersecurity, but they intend on increasing that cybersecurity budget by on average 25% this coming year. So it really speaks to this has become a, a matter of great importance for safety and soundness uh, and sustainability of the brands. Yeah, one of the things the report points out is that uh, a, a majority are concerned with security on cryptocurrency exchanges. I'm curious, you know, to what degree uh, does cryptocurrency enable these sort of heists? Okay, so there's two parts to that question. First of all, we have to accept the fact that, you know, financial institutions of today are trying to become technology companies. And in mm -hmm. doing so, they're trying to reach out to the, the modern uh, generation space retail customer base by providing access to virtual currencies and storage of virtual currencies as well. And in majority of those cases, they partner with smaller fintech firms. And the first step in that process is building out an API. And this is why you're seeing this surge of API attacks into these institutions. This is compounded by the fact that the majority are paying ransom uh, when they're ransomed on average, uh, you know, roughly two times a year. And, and that's highly problematic because they're feeding the beast. Um, but what I would point out here is not all virtual currencies and exchanges are equal in terms of how they pay attention to security, their investment in security, or their desire to align with the principles of FATF, the Financial Action Task Force. So based on the information that you all have gathered here, what are your recommendations? Well, we need to really understand that the adversary is already within the environment. So given the fact that the adversary is in the environment at some point, there's no way to be 100% preventative vis-a-vis -vis, you've got nation state adversaries working with cyber crime cartels to offset economic sanctions. They will get in. But when they get in, can you defend from within? And I think defending from within is all about making sure that you can achieve intrusion suppression. So can you, can you detect, deceive, divert, contain, and hunt an adversary unbeknownst to the adversary because you don't want an escalation to a destructive attack, which are increasing dramatically. So you have to integrate your, your network detection response capabilities with your endpoint detection response capabilities. You have to apply micro-segmentation. You should automate vulnerability management, particularly for outward-facing critical vulnerabilities as defined by CISA. Uh, I do believe in the use of deception and decoy technologies along attack paths that can't be hardened. You should activate application control and high enforcement, conduct weekly threat hunting that extends to the sea level, that extends to the administrative assistance of the sea level, even though that sounds taboo, and use that as justification for prioritization for cybersecurity investments, and really, really focus 
on DevSecOps and API security. And finally, ensuring that your backups are immutable and viable and periodic in nature will be quintessentially important given the fact that most financial institutions suffered a destructive cyber attack this past year. That's Tom Kellerman from VMware. There's a lot more to this conversation. If you want to hear more, head on over to CyberWire Pro and sign up for Interview Selects, where you'll get access to this and many more extended interviews. And now, a word from our sponsor, Barracuda. Right now, everyone is talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at barracuda.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Barracuda for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Brian Vorntran. He is Assistant Director from the FBI's Cyber Division. And we're also joined by Deputy Assistant Attorney General Adam Hickey. Gentlemen, welcome to the CyberWire. Thanks, Dave. Good to be here. Brian, uh, let me start off with you here. I know you and your colleagues have been uh, doing some work lately regarding reverse web shells, uh, hafnium. Can you bring us up to date? What's going on? Sure, Dave. And thanks for the opportunity to join with you today. You know, back in 2020, uh, there was a, a broad vulnerability identified in the Microsoft Exchange server. It really came to light at the end of 2020, uh, but really received its first public disclosure in early January of 2021. And essentially, the Chinese state-sponsored group known as Hafnium had installed tens of thousands of PowerShells in, multi, in computers and servers here in the United States that pose a huge vector for potential attack. Very interesting um, tradecraft by the adversary that exposed a lot of computers and servers and put us in the position, not only with Microsoft, but with our partners at CISA and NSA, to take some unique action. Looking forward to talking about that with you today. Well, let's dig right in then. I mean, what are some of the actions that you all took there? First disclosure of the vulnerability was really identified by Microsoft on approximately January 2nd of 2021. Moving into early March of that year, March 3rd to be specific, Microsoft published another advisory and they actually credited the vulnerability finding, or the location of the vulnerability to DevCore. But then on March 10th, um, the FBI and CISA published a joint cybersecurity advisory titled The Compromise of the Microsoft Exchange Server which really highlighted the vulnerability and how to mitigate that vulnerability. So I think when we have these types of opportunities, we very much look at it to move from least intrusive to most intrusive in terms of investigative or operational techniques that we can deploy to essentially mitigate the attack surface that the adversary has access to. So in this case, Microsoft uh, disclosed their vulnerability then the cybersecurity advisory that was joint between the FBI and CISA further uh, should to allowed owners of those computers or affected servers to take mitigation steps. But then on the backside of that, the FBI conducted thousands of victim notifications to try and reduce that attack surface even further. So between the Microsoft disclosure in early January of that year, the cybersecurity advisory, and the thousands of victim notifications, the FBI essentially was able to work with CISA and others to reduce the attack surfaces through those PowerShells by about 90 to 95 percent, but that left still between 5 and 10 percent of the attack surface available to the adversary. We're joined by Deputy Assistant Attorney General Adam Hickey. Um, Adam, what part does the DOJ have to play in an effort like this? 
So around the time that, that Brian's talking, there's going to be constant communication between the FBI's cyber division and the relevant component of the Justice Department where the you know, lawyers are going to provide legal advice. And that, in this case, was the National Security Division. And we're going to be monitoring the threat reporting along with them. We're going to be monitoring the advisories that go out and the impact that has on the public and where we stand at a certain moment in time. And the FBI is going to ask us, what more can we do? Is there more we can do? And we're going to ask them, do you have a capability? And we're going to look at the capability they develop, and we're going to look at the law and what the law requires. And if there's a match, uh, we may be in a position to take action that fully remediates or more fully remediates the problem. Can you walk us through this particular example? Or, you know, both of you, how does this one play out and, and where do we stand today? Sure. David's Brian, and I'll start with that. You know, as we were left with between 5 and 10 percent of the attack surface left, we really come to a question of uh, do we have the authorities and the technical capability to mitigate the rest of the vulnerable computers or servers that are being used or could be used by the adversary, in this case, uh, China? And the answer to that in this case was yes, we have the authority through Rule 41 and we have the capability through some really, really good technical skills we have in our field offices and here at headquarters. And so in this particular scenario, we leveraged our Rule 41 authority and a technical operation to essentially seek a court order, a standard warrant, to remove the remaining web shells. And in this case, what we did is we copied the web shell so that we were able to maintain it for evidentiary purposes. And then we essentially deleted the web shell. And by deleting the web shell, we essentially broke the communication or the vector of attack that was available between the actor, the Chinese government, and the computers they had installed the PowerShell on. So just really good work um, by the FBI and by DOJ finding the authority to do this work and then developing a very, very advanced technical tool to actually deliver the result. But I think it would be worth, Adam, talking briefly about Rule 41 and our authorities and how they apply to this type of operation. Sure. And, and I think to do that, I think we have to also add a third element to this operation, which is a source that was able to help us out with identifying the file paths of the web shells on the victim's computers. And that is probably one of, this gets at one of the reasons why public notification wasn't sufficient in this case. Uh, every one of the web shells had a unique file path. It's a dynamic address, if you will, such that we couldn't put out a standard one-size-fits-all advisory to the public that says, look here, look in this folder, look in for this particular sequence of characters. That's how you'll find the web shell. Instead, we we're fortunate that we had information from a source that advised us what those file paths were, and that allowed us to go to the court and say, look, we have probable cause to believe that this evidence and also instrumentality of a crime is located uh, on these victim systems and ask the court for a warrant, uh, as we would in, in another comparable case in the physical world, uh, allowing us to seize effectively the web shell to search uh, it, to copy it, and then to delete it. And Brian, are you satisfied as you look back on this activity that uh, the things played out the way that you hoped that they would? Yeah, we really are. I think it's a great opportunity for the department and for the FBI to really leverage the unique authorities we have in the cyber ecosystem within the intelligence community and the interagency and the overlap with private sector. And you couple that with just Great work by some of our agents and computer scientists in the field at headquarters to develop the technical capability to do this work, <clears throat> knowing we were left with this attack surface and, and owing to the American public a responsibility to behave in their best interest, not only within the policies and procedures and laws that we operate within to protect the American public's rights, but also to eliminate an attack vector from a very, very sophisticated adversary. We're very, very um, happy with the results because we feel we completely eliminated that threat at that time. All right. Well, Assistant Director Brian Vordren from the FBI's Cyber Division and Adam Hickey, Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice, thank you for joining us.
Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Keeper Security. Protect every user and system in your organization with zero trust and zero knowledge security. Visit KeeperSecurity.com slash CyberWire to learn more. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Rob Pentazopoulos from SecureWorks. We're discussing their work, Our Evil Development Adds Confidence About Gold Southfield Reemergence. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Liz Irvin, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Rachel Gelfin, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Falecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. And now a word from our sponsor, Soul Cyber. Cyber insurance is a necessity these days, but with one in three applications being rejected and premiums increasing 50% or more, it may feel like dealing with the repercussions of ransomware and hackers might just be easier. Find out how Soul Cyber can help you get the right level of protection, fast track your cyber insurance application, and even save you up to 30% on your premium with their Soul Cyber Insurance Plus program. Learn more at soulcyber.com slash insurance. That's S-O-L-C-Y-B-E-R dot com slash insurance. And we thank Soul Cyber for sponsoring our show.